frame rate. Duke Nukem Forever. You know this story, or at the very least you're familiar with it. 3D Realms has the game in development hell for 12 years. Multiple screenshots and trailers taunt us for something that we slowly accept as potentially never coming out. But then it did in 2011, and it was a mediocre experience. This wasn't always the case. Duke Nukem Forever was at one point something, well, I'm not at the lengths to say whether this would have been an amazing game or not, but I'm sure it would have been better than what we got. I've always been fascinated by these early builds, and ever since the 2001 build was leaked, I've been just short of obsessed. Before we take a look at that, let's go back, way back, to the very beginning. No, not there. Mm, closer. Yeah, that's more like it. Today we're beginning a series where I take a look at everything Duke Nukem Forever, from the beginning up to the final release which I'll go into more detail about some other day. A lot of information for the early builds of Duke Nukem Forever have been discovered and documented by prominent members of the Duke Nukem community. A huge thank you is deserved to the following sources, where you can find the information that I've collected for some portions of this video. Duke Nukem Forever in 1996 Inspired by the original Duke Nukem games, the intention for Forever, in 1996, was to be a side-scroller. Being produced by their own Keith Schuler one of Duke Nukem 3D's level designers, it was destined to be called Duke Nukem Forever. Although the public only has access to four screenshots, their project was rumored to have achieved milestones. It had a nearly completed story, working items and weapons, functional enemies, bosses, and a multiplayer mode. After cancellation, the existing project would be transformed into Alien Rampage, developed by Inner Circle Creations. Admittedly, what little we've seen of the original didn't look very good to me, but it's hard to say what that would have looked like if it had been given full development. What came of it in the end feels to be a decent forgotten side-scroller. Many have said this original Duke Nukem Forever would be the inspiration for the Duke Nukem Manhattan Project, but according to publisher A Rush Entertainment, this was merely a coincidence and Manhattan Project was an original game. This was the first attempt to develop Duke Nukem Forever. The game has a fitting title that has created a variety of jokes across the video game world, most sounding something like, Man, this game is taking forever. So where did this name actually come from? Well, there is the obvious pun with the number 4, seeing as how this is Duke's fourth game. But to be more specific, in 1996, George Broussard, co-founder of 3D Realms and project leader for most of the game's development, was inspired to name it in parody of Batman Forever. Great reference for a game that comes out in 2011. I guess they could have done the Duke Knight, but that sounds fucking weird. Anyways, while Duke Nukem Forever was being developed, 3D Realms tried their hand at introducing 3D voxels to the build engine, which is what was used to develop their last game, Duke Nukem 3D. This would at the time serve as a concept for what could be their next full-blown Duke Nukem game. Didn't happen, but fans would get their Duke fix the following year anyways. In an interview with Scott Miller, founder of their parent company Apogee Software, he said the reason they had to cancel their voxel game was because making a quick sequel just wasn't worth it to them. They began this project mid-development of Shadow Warrior, and that ate up an extra year of their time. By that point, a voxel game wouldn't really stand out, so they looked to other possibilities. The last significant detail of 1996 would be GT Interactive acquiring the rights to publish Duke Nukem Forever. This wouldn't be a permanent change, as the rights would be sold off a couple more times throughout development. Duke Nukem Forever in 1997. It's January. 3D Realms buys a license to the Quake engine. Under the direction of Todd Replogle and Alan H. Blum III, programmers Chris Hargrove and Nick Schaffner began totally rewriting the Quake entity system. This was done to provide more interactive elements for the game. On April 28th, 1997, Forever was announced to the public as a new FPS sequel to Duke Nukem 3D. Scott Miller's prediction is that it'll be released before Christmas of that year. This picture here shows a level editor working in Quake ED. It marks the first time the game would ever be seen. What's up with this picture, though? Well, it was clipped out of an old webcam tour of the 3D Realms office. In September, one screenshot would finally be released. Then two months later, PC Gamer magazine would reveal the game to many unseen eyes, showing what was a build of Duke Nukem Forever in the Quake engine. This version of the game was targeted for a release of Spring 1998. Now, regarding the time of this article being published, the comments are almost exclusively reflective of using the id Tech 2 engine, which they were actually still to get their hands on the code for. 
George Broussard comments, there was a game here, and these are real screenshots. Still, I imagine the levels were mostly, if not completely, uninhabited. What we do know is that there were at least three functioning weapons at the time, a rocket launcher, shotgun, with flashlight attachment. Unfortunately, I was unable to find any images of the chain gun. Broussard said they planned on having a lot of new weapons, but no more than ten. At that point, the game becomes silly and unfocused, as he says. And as someone who has recently read a lot of what this guy said over the years, I can assure you that his opinions vary greatly over time. This picture demonstrates the player destroying nearby terrain with the rocket launcher. It's likely one of few pointless sequences that was designed specifically for the press. Other things to make note of are the vehicles, which the team had been very excited about putting into the game. There's tons of concept art depicting Duke riding a couple of these, but it was made very clear that these were just concepts and only a few of these ideas were being considered for the game. Which vehicles specifically is never said. Broussard assures that there will be a motorcycle at least, but later says the team isn't quite committed to that idea. I can't imagine there was much of a story at this point. There are subtle clues scattered around and I've put them together to give what I feel to be a fairly accurate representation of what they were trying to achieve at this point. Dr. Proton has located Duke Nukem in the Las Vegas Strip. He begins his attack, which includes uniting with Duke Nukem's previous enemies in order to put an end to his heroism once and for all. Only a small chunk of the game was meant to take place in the Las Vegas Strip, as Duke would spend most of his adventure traveling across Nevada. With his home destroyed, he has no choice but to go up against Dr. Proton and save the world again. In the fight, Duke will come across cyborgs, robots, and biological experiments created by Dr. Proton in an attempt to thwart your success. The game would have many cinematic scenes, but at the time they were uncertain about how to present them, whether pre-rendered or in-game. Ultimately, what mattered to them most was that their cinematics would be considered top of the line for the early sixth generation of gaming. At this point, there were plans to include the Grand Canyon and Hoover Dam as playable locations in the game. The Hoover Dam specifically was chosen as a location for the game after Broussard saw it in a user-made Duke Nukem 3D map. How these locations would connect in the game was not explained at the time. Broussard even said that he feels developers often give away too much of their game before it comes out, which is probably why we know so little about this. Broussard also mentions the ambition to up the ante once again in terms of video game interactivity. It became a standard for the development of Duke Nukem Forever, which is one of many things that contributed to its development problems, but that's more relevant later. Most of the bad guys you've become familiar with from Duke Nukem 3D were not meant to make a return here. Broussard confirms that only the pig cop would come back for forever, this time wearing military duds instead of the police uniform. Ironically, the final Duke Nukem Forever featured those old enemies prominently, and the pig cops were just... hogs. Level designer Stephen Cool says that bringing big outdoor environments to an engine designed for claustrophobic dungeons brings with it many challenges. Now, let me ask you something. How familiar are you with 3D Realms Prey? This game has its own interesting story that I'm not at the lengths to expand on right now. In short, it was another game being worked on by the same developers around the same time. Prey would at this time use 3D Realms own in-house engine. What's been seen of this has long been considered cutting edge for the time. We can achieve areas of what we call hyper-realism, which probably have 20 to 30 times the polygon count that you might see in like a Quake 2 engine. So why didn't they use this engine for Duke Nukem Forever? Well, 3D Realms had different plans. They wanted the game to be accessible to people with older computers without the need of 3D graphics cards. In a future post, Broussard would say the following, It is of utmost importance to us to have Prey to be the first game released using the Prey technology. Now this is my speculation, but Broussard over the years expresses many fears of other companies stealing their ideas before they can release a game, and when I think more about this, I feel he lacks confidence in their ability to get work done within a reasonable time frame. There are more remarks I could study here, however I think they're better saved for later, as these details will become more relevant when compared with other future events. In May, two noteworthy members of 3D Realms, Randy Pitchford, a mapper, and Brian Martell, an artist, left 3D Realms to create Rebel Boat Rocker. They would go on to develop a game called Prax War 2018, which would be cancelled after their publisher, Electronic Arts, gave up on their project for not progressing as quickly as they'd hoped. Five of the remaining members of Rebel Boat Rocker went on to create Gearbox Software, and you don't need me to tell you their eventual significance in this project. Gearbox is responsible, in part, for finishing up and releasing 2011's Duke Nukem Forever with Triptych and Piranha Games. Duke Nukem Forever in 1998. 3D Realms is now officially using the id Tech 2 engine, as the swap was made sometime in December of 1997. 
No exact figure's been disclosed, but there's a recurring rumor about it setting them back approximately $500,000. Thankfully, 3D Realms was still bleeding money from their Duke Nukem 3D sales. The existing work on their previous id Tech build could not be transferred over due to code incompatibilities. Development is restarted. This time, their work on the Quake 2 engine was destined to make it the most advanced id Tech 2 game ever. Sadly, at this time, 3D Realms became secretive about the project. I assume the reason is they felt they've said enough already. Nonetheless, here's the business. It's 1998, and the E3 conference is a go. During the GT Interactive segment, Duke Nukem Forever is shown to the world in video form for the first time. What you can gather from this footage is limited. Whether the game itself was more than a mock-up at this point is unsure, but what's shown in the trailer almost certainly was. There are numerous set pieces which I imagine were nothing more than what was shown. Buildings collapse, scenery can be destroyed. Cool for the time, and we did assume this would make it into the final game in some form. We have no way of knowing if the game had any kind of cohesion at this point. For instance, this chase scene where the cover is blown off a transport truck with Duke inside, it's possible the sequence started and ended here, and similarly can be said for most of these shots. Something interesting I noted of the chase scene is the non-stop explosions going off at the end of the road. You can see buildings passing by on the left and right side, which disappear as they've reached the explosion. Whatever this explosion was meant to symbolize is one thing, but what they were actually doing here was trying to hide the limitations of the id Tech 2 engine with the visual obstruction. The engine wasn't particularly good at rendering big landscapes with wide open spaces. Hmm, I feel like we already did this. So yes, the id Tech 2 engine would be a challenge for the ambitious plans they had with Duke Nukem Forever. The trailer shows off a few noteworthy concepts. There are at least four enemy types available. It's hard to say if these were all commanded by Dr. Proton. A UFO makes an appearance, nearly striking a supporting character who we'll mention in a moment. Then we see Duke shooting down a Boeing Chinook, suggested to be flown by human-ant hybrids known as Army Ants. Dr. Proton has reanimated Area 51's military guards with bionic enhancements and, I guess, ant DNA? I'm sure this would have been expanded on more in the game. The trailer shows off three variants of the Army Ant. There's the usual grunt. Some have the ability to cloak. The other Army Ant we see is much larger, able to outrun a vehicle on the freeway, and is entirely chrome. Everything is chrome in the future! One could assume Dr. Proton would continue to experiment on these hybrids as the game progresses, introducing new challenges for the player to overcome. Army Ant AI was very poor at this point, only seeming to follow the most basic commands. Walk around, perform a melee attack. In a lot of these shots, they're not even behaving with hostility. In this shot, Duke's a huge asshole and kills hopeless ant people. Maybe the developers came up with these guys thinking about how many ants they killed with magnifying glasses as a kid. Do people still do that? I hope not. The army ants went extinct by the time we'd see Duke Nukem Forever again, so Duke's clearly a monster and he needs to be contained. One strong focus of the trailer would be Duke's companion, Shelly Bombshell Harrison. You may have heard of her throughout the years as she's popped up in other projects since. Sadly, her big reveal in Duke Nukem Forever never came to be, as she was completely absent from the final game. Inspired by the movie Barbed Wire, Bombshell would be a supporting NPC character for Duke, and at the time was not meant to be a playable character other than her use as a multiplayer model. The trailer shows a working turret section, and a scene where Duke shoots up a garage using a fighter jet. It's anyone's guess whether the jet did anything more than turn and shoot at this point. On multiple occasions, the developers said action scenes like this were very much inspired by James Bond. We can see two weapons here being used, an assault rifle and pistol. They both have secondary modes. The assault rifle has a built-in grenade launcher, and the pistol has an attached scope. Even at this point, the assault rifle has its trademark American flag tied to it. Regarding the gameplay, a few comments can be pulled from an interview with Scott Miller, again, founder of their parent company Apogee Software, who said the following in a magazine. We have a new way of thinking about puzzles that is unique, and more like those seen in true adventure games. Simple find-the-key-unlock-the-door puzzles will be mostly gone from this game, says Miller in the 1998 issue of Computer Gaming World. An earlier comment by George Broussard says, Duke Nukem Forever will have its own unique feel, setting, and gameplay. When we're done, you won't even care that it's the Quake 2 engine anymore. Yeah, I don't need to tell you that this opinion didn't stick around for too long. The magazine says, Broussard knows with so much competition on the way, standing out from the crowd is critical. Yeah, and that was the mindset that killed the game. Although you do have to keep in mind, Duke Nukem 3D was a complete game changer when it came out. The sequel to it could be a make or break for the series, because despite Duke's previous side-scroller success, Duke Nukem 3D brought the character to the eyes of an audience that might not have cared about him before, and now they need to live up to that. Else Duke Nukem could end up becoming a one-hit wonder or a niche subject, neither of which 3D Realms wanted. 
The earlier mentioned Computer Gaming World magazine starts the Forever article by saying at least a half a dozen true 3D action games have been released at that point in time. In other words, the pressure was on to get this thing finished. Or so you'd think. 3D Realms was making progress, reportedly far more than what's been shown. Kevin Brown, author of the article, says he was given the opportunity to play the game himself. He pushed past a collapsing rope bridge, shot real-time street lamps, and witnessed satisfying John Woo-like mega explosions. Yeah, at the time I think it was a mock-up. A new location was confirmed here, a ghost town called Morningwood. Aha. Uh -huh. We can see a prospector approach Duke in the trailer, a scene that takes place in Morningwood. The character would be named Gus. As of this trailer, there's not much about him beyond the surface level identity, but he does appear to give perhaps a keycard to Duke, and follows it up with some dialogue. I think. Yeah, it's not really easy to tell. Many of the game's 20 levels were completed, according to Brown, but that comment isn't very specific. Were they fully playable or just empty landscapes? While at the time, critics were very impressed with the progress of Duke Nukem Forever, project lead George Broussard was not. Which I suppose at this point is fine. There's a lot of competition, and having the most advanced Quake 2 engine wasn't going to turn heads for much longer. The evolution of video game technology was unfortunately something that the team, more specifically George Broussard, underestimated. Every year that passed meant more processing speed, lifelike graphics, and of course better engines. But to go to the lengths of swapping engines, it's not an easy decision to make. This puts a major dent into any project. It's why most teams will bite the bullet and accept what they're working with. And that's the kind of mindset that gives us great games like Duke Nukem 3D. I don't need to tell you that Quake made Duke Nukem 3D look like a product of yesteryear. Now it's June 1998. A business decision is made by George Broussard. He reveals to the public that all of their work in the id Tech 2 engine has been scrapped. Duke Nukem Forever would now use the Unreal Engine, as it would give the team the ability to render large open landscapes, like the Hoover Dam. Broussard notes that fans can expect all the stuff they saw at E3 to make the crossover into the Unreal Engine. He believed the effort would not significantly delay the game. Earlier in 1997, 3D Realms hired a game artist known as Brian Cousins. He believes that if it weren't for the Hoover Dam, they would have probably stuck with the id Tech 2 engine and finished the game then. Well, if that ain't a mic drop. Join me for the next part of this exciting dive into the history of Duke Nukem Forever's development, where we'll take a look at what happened between 1999 and 2002. As always, I'll catch you Frame Raiders in the next video.